I'm Philip Papadopoulos. Uh, I have a couple of jobs here at UCSD. One, I'm a research scientist in Cal IT2. Uh, work with Tom DeFonte and Larry Smarr on a variety of things. I'm also the chief technology officer at uh, the San Diego Supercomputer Center. So today I want to talk to you, I, I'm really going to tell you a story about 40 gigabit ethernet and how things are still hard. I think part of uh, why I think this particular talk would be interesting to people in Cyan is uh, while Cyan is you know, really pushing on the edges of optical networking, um, it's good to have a baseline as to what can happen with commodity components and commodity network. Um, it's, the, the, story isn't always, the story isn't always clean and it isn't always clear and sort of want to give some people some background who may only be optics folks what it looks like from the systems uh, from the system side of things. So uh, a little bit of history before a little bit of history before I start. We've been doing meaning, meaning folks like uh, Larry Smarr and Tom DeFonte and I have been working in the arena of high speed commodity networks and utilization of those networks, not so much the low level design, the, the low level optical design of the networks, but actually using them. And so in 2002, there was a large, uh, large NSF grant that was, awarded to, that was awarded to us, and that sort of kicked things off here uh, at Cal IT2. Uh, in 2004, um, we, built a, we built our first sort of 10 gigabit enabled commodity uh, network. That was, called, uh, that was called Quartzite. And it was a companion to the Optiputer grant. The Optiputer grant itself was trying to ask the question, if the network ceases to become a, a bottleneck in bandwidth, how do you redesign software and applications to work in that environment? You know, prior to, you know, if, we, if we go back into the you know, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, uh, people always conserve the network as a very rare system resource. And when they conserve the network as that rare system resource, they made certain assumptions about, I, I can't go and retrieve a gigabyte of data remotely. It will take me too long. And in, in a next generation network, that just simply isn't true. So in 2005, this is what our campus map looked like uh, for, uh, for Quartzsite and Optiputer. At the ends, we had Linux clusters. Uh, generally, those clusters were had nodes that had one gigabit Ethernet adapters, and then we aggregated up into 10 gigabit, uh, 10 gigabit lanes uh, through switches. And there were a small number of sites. Uh, co-location was, there was colo a co-located switch, so you could look at this as a uh, star pattern for the, fiber, for the fiber plant. And it all came into, it all came into a particular switching complex. So at, at the edge of our campus, going out through UCSD, there was a, a Juniper T320, uh, now, now long since retired as, as things go forward. In the middle of our network, we had a Chiaro and Astara router. And this was a, this was a network startup by uh, Steve Wallach, very well funded, had a very interesting way of moving optical signals inside of the router. Um, if anybody ever wants to find out about that particular device, you know, come c contact me after uh, contact me after the talk. The the Astara was a, an enormous kind of room sized router when things were done, but it had the capability, if we had the money and we didn't, to be able to do a 128 uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. That was in 2005, and do that at a do that at full bandwidth um, switching. So just about a decade ago. Uh, about two years ago now, uh, Larry and others and I wrote a grant to refresh that uh, optical networking infrastructure on our campus to make it to move more towards commodity um, hardware, to make things that were less expensive, and to build something that we could give others a blueprint of what we've, of what we've done. And so we wanted to replace the core of the Quartzsite network with a commodity packet switch. In this case, um, it's an Arista 7504E. The capability of the switch, it has 10, 40 gigabit, and 100 gigabit ethernet capability in the switch itself. It's a full bisection fabric, and the way I like to describe it is that when we, when we connect 
we connect labs from around campus into this particular into this particular switch. We're giving them at Ethernet sort of the switching backplane that we have inside of commodity clusters. So uh, we also were able to widen sort of the data freeway between Cal IT2 and SDSC so that uh, any lab that was connected to Prism had a large sort of had a large pathway to the supercomputers that are that are at SDSC. Um, this is this is now a, it's a, it's a drawing of the various sites. We expanded the number of sites. Still not, you know, it's it's not intended to scale to every building on campus. That's not what we're trying to do with with Prism, but it physically moved. I know that it's hard to tell on the map, but the uh, the sort of geographic center is now in this particular building where I'm talking from, which is Atkinson Hall, and then we would connect very we connect various sites or various labs on campus, depending on what their perceived bandwidth needs are. So we'll do anywhere, you know, 10 is sort of the entry level, and uh, 40, 40, gigabit, 40 gigabits per second is more common. 80 gigabits uh, we see every now and then depends on, the, uh, depends on the particular lab that we're talking about. Um, the reason why we're building this network is we, have a, we actually have a pretty nice campus network. There, there's a redundant 10 gigabit ring that uh, interconnects all the buildings through uh, about three or four major routing nodes on campus. Maybe it's five or, maybe it's five or six. The, the point is, is that on that network, there are about 80,000 active IP addresses at any particular time. And if we have any big data transfer that would happen over that network, a single endpoint could saturate the entire campus network and essentially be a denial of service for, for the time that somebody is transferring a file from one lab to another or from one lab to the supercomputer center or out of their lab out onto a, a high-speed external, uh, high external network. We also wanted to be able to do some experimentation with software-defined networking. In this case, really, uh, we really mean open flow, and we're just we're, we're sort of neophytes at that. We're still trying to learn what OpenFlow could and, and could not do for us. And then if you look at Prism as a, as a network itself, we have routing bridges to the various things, to the various networks that we care about. So for example, we have a 20 gigabit per second bridge to the campus network. That means our network can completely saturate the campus if we're not careful. Um, and we also go to exceed resources, so those are the national supercomputer centers, um, you know, spread around the country. Uh, Off-campus resources, we're here in San Diego. There's the high-tech biology, biotech mesa, that is uh, easily within unamplified fiber distance. Um, if we want to, if we have collaborators that are at these biotech companies, they want to work with people on campus. The actual network today, what it looks like as, you know, as it's actually wired, it is still the star pattern. That's the same pattern that we've retained since we did the quartzite, uh, since we did quartzite. And you can see a number, every, every floor in this building is at 10 or 20 gigabits per second. Uh, we have a number of clusters that are connected at 40 or 50 gigabits per second. We have, uh, you know, places like the Center for Research and Biological Structure connected at 80 gigabits per second. We're connected to SDSC at 80. We're also connected to our campus border at 80 gigabits per second. And then, you know, there, there, are, a variety of, there, there are a variety of labs involved in this particular picture. So, you know, we have uh, a little bit over a terabit of terminated bandwidth inside of that, inside of the core, uh, core routing structure. And if you've, if you've not seen one of these switches, they're actually little tidy little guys. They're, um, uh, they're essentially 7U tall uh, with 11 and a half terabits of uh, non-blocking switching bandwidth in the back plane. So this is, this is what you get electrically. This, this switch as we've configured it is about $250,000. It, uh, it has 48 10 gigabit ethernet ports, 200 gigabit ethernet ports, and 36 uh, 40 gigabit Ethernet ports. Um, the relationship, as you know, the relationship, sort of in a cartoon way, if we look at Prism, is that you see the Prism network, and then we have these routing bridges to these other networks. So that just allows you to allows you to take a look at how we interact with the with the other external and on campus uh, on campus networks. 
So the other thing that we learned in Optiputer is that sort of building a network like this, just doing the network design is not enough. Um, we really have to build network endpoints. And when it was during, when we were doing Optiputer and our sort of first edition of this network, uh, we had commodity clusters at the endpoint. And we would, need, um, we would need roughly 10 commodity endpoints, each running at a gigabit per second to fill a 10 gigabit per second pipe. That's changed, those, those sort of costs and the commodity capabilities have changed pretty dramatically. So what we're building now, we call these, we call these boxes Fiona's for a flash IO node. Um, they are, they can be put in a desktop format, they can be put in a server format, but basically it's a, generally a single socket, sometimes a dual socket system with uh, dual tens or dual 40 gigabit ethernet adapters attached to them, some flash drives and some hard drives. So these are, uh, they're, they're sort of put on the network storage appliances that we hope to go from, you know, the, the goal and we, we've gotten most of the way there uh, from disk to network at uh, between two and three gigabytes per second. So not 40 gigabit ethernet, not 40 gigabit, but you know, maybe 25 gigabits as we're going to and from disk. These nodes also can be used as just sort of pure memory to network drivers so that we can, we can do some testing. Um, the, the building blocks are just commodity pieces. We, for the disks, we use, we use uh, RAID controllers, not RAID controllers, just HBA controllers. They run a few hundred bucks. Uh, the, we can, the, the network adapter prices sort of continue to change sort of a single port 40 gigabit ethernet adapter is about $400 these, $400 these days. And we can, we can configure a server that is useful to us in a variety of circumstances between $2,000 and about $6,000 or $7,000. So the first part of this, let's, now, now I want to tell you a story about you know, what it's like in the trenches with, uh, with, with the current state of software. So. Uh, in previous experience in building with 10 gig, and when we were first working with 10 gigabit interfaces and nodes, there was a lot, you know, a large amount of protocol processing overhead that you had to deal with, and so the the general uh, consensus or you know sort of best working practices were go build a dual socket server. It has lots of memory bandwidth. It has lots of cycle issue bandwidth, and you should be able to handle 10 gigabits per. 10 gigabits per second. And you needed that five or six or seven years ago when trying to deal with 10 gigabit ethernet adapters. You don't need that today. A large fraction of 10 gigabit um, protocol processing can be offloaded. CPUs are faster and a variety of things. But now we're moving to 40 gigabits and so our first thought was, well, we need, we'll be, probably be back into the same place where we need lots of memory bandwidth and lots of issue bandwidth cycle issue bandwidth so that we can do TCP protocol processing without, uh, without a problem. Um, you know, to get to the punchline, and then I'll get you through where, the, where particular issues are, going to a dual socket server actually caused us a lot of pain and consternation over the last year. We think we've solved it, um, but trying a bunch of things, and a lot of this talk is telling you the story of, of going down there. So, uh, this, this graph is maybe a half a year old. We got to a point where it looked like that we were, rece that we were getting 40 gigabit ethernet. Now this, this testing is, we're, we're interested in single stream TCP bandwidth. If you want to make one connection between client and server, how fast can you push from the memory of your client to the memory of your server? That's the, that, that, that's the first mark to see where we first mark to see where we are. Um, and in one way, if we just ran with nothing special turned on, meaning uh, we're not pinning processes to a particular CPU, um, we would max out at you know, 31, 32, 33 gigabits per second. And if we pushed hard, we might get 36 or 37. So this is about, this is sort of the state of where we were half a year ago. And we were reasonably happy. We had to go to a particular version of the kernel, and we had to have a particular version of a driver to make this happen. But we said, well, that's, that's pretty good. Um, but here's what the graph doesn't show. Right? The performance numbers, that graph looks nice, but the reality is that the performance numbers weren't stable. 
we would see those perform we would see good performance some of the time, most of the time, but not all of the time. We would we would scratch our heads sort of wondering why were we getting why were we getting bad performance? We're testing on completely unloaded uh, completely unloaded systems. We tested a variety we tested in a variety of circumstances. Single socket servers, dual socket servers, single port adapters, dual port adapters, different kernels, different configurations of TCP, different configurations of buffer and memory management, a large variety, a large number of parameters. What we'd see when we were actually testing is that if you watch a transfer going on, and you, you, know, you follow it in one or two second increments and you're running a test for maybe a few minutes, um, that an instantaneous bandwidth would sort of vary between about a megabit per second, and that, that's not, that should say gigabits, not 39 megabits, and about 39 gigabits per second. Several orders of magnitude, more than two. I was, sorry, I was a little, little sleepy when I made this slide. Um, this was terrible, right? We were seeing we were seeing 40 gigabit Ethernet adapters perform significantly worse than the wireless adapter that's on my laptop. It was just, and it, 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 if, if, you, if you could see me, you'd see I have a, a head mostly now full of gray hair, and a lot of gray hairs were actually, la were actually added over this last year. So the first thing you do, and the first thing that your vendor tells you to do is, well, go to the tuning guide. So you go to the Mellanox, you break out the tuning guide and there you can look at the tuning guide for trying to simply get data from the memory of system A to the memory of system B using TCP 24 pages of try this and try that advice right so it says try this try that measure it and every time you make a measurement every time you make a change you do a measurement that takes anywhere from 20 seconds to 10 or 15 minutes and if we're looking for if, if we're looking for stability of a measurement, we actually need to run for a longer period of time. Um, sometimes the advice seemed to work, but actually more often than not, we'd make a fix and because we changed something, whatever was internal to the driver reset and it worked for a little while and then we sort of saw the high variability again. So in, in reality, sort of all the tuning advice, almost none of it worked, right? And, and, and we really couldn't, we really couldn't uh, tell what was going on. So we said, okay, let's start, let's start looking more closely at the physical system and see if we can find things that look like smoking guns or things that, you know, that might be uh, contributing to this sort of high variability of performance. So what you're looking at here is uh, a memory bandwidth graph. So the, the lines that are in blue are, uh, is sustainable memory bandwidth using particular sizes um, or using, using a particular number of threads. Uh, on a the blue ones are the dual socket server. He actually, so keep in mind a dual socket server is actually a painful server in this, in this condition. The, the sort of not blue colors, I'm sorry, I'm slightly colorblind. Uh, the not blue colors are memory bandwidth as we're varying number of threads on a single socket server. And we saw this enormous drop off you know, as we went from as we went from sort of 18 to 19 or 20 threads on a particular system, and this was reproducible. It's reproducible across kernels, and we thought, oh, that must be the problem. And we spent uh, a great deal of time trying to figure out what was going on, reducing number of trying to reduce the number of threads so that we kept the thread counts in the you know sort of uh, very good in the in the very good bandwidth region. I don't know why that popped up. Um, in, in the very good bandwidth region and whatnot. Turns out, this was really an aberration in the stream benchmark. We spent a few months sort of chasing down this rabbit hole. It's not really the, uh, it's, it, it, it was symptomatic of something else, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a symptom of the problem that, um, that we were seeing. Let's see. Okay, now my laptop is stuck. There we go. So, it's worthwhile now to sort of take a tour through what a dual socket server actually looks like, right? So now we were, we were looking at memory, we actually have to, we actually have to try to think about uh, how data is flowing through, this, flowing through the server from the network to the, to the server. So typically when you're, when you're looking at 
when you look at a dual, you know, modern dual socket server, two sockets are put down, two processors are put in. Each processor, physical socket, has its own memory bus. It has its own uh, external I/O bus, and then those two, the two sockets are connected through something. At least for in the Intel world, QPI, Quick Path Interconnect. Uh, QPI runs at 25. 25 and, and change gigabytes per second. There's not really a bandwidth limitation. A particular memory DIMM or memory channel will run at about 12 gigabytes per second. Uh, PCI lanes are running at just shy of 8 gigabits per second. The cards are 8 lanes, so there's, there's 64 gigabits per second. We're trying, to push, we're trying to push 40 gigabits through that. So there's enough bandwidth. But the, the key is, is that the adapter is on a single CPU. So if there's some process on the alternate CPU that's trying to uh, sort of message or talk to the network interface, it has to go through the QPI bus. And that is, you know, that may be, may not be, but it is something that is quite a bit, something that is uh, quite peculiar to, dual, to modern dual socket servers. So some other trivia items about the about a dual socket server. The memory itself is non-uniform memory access. It is, it is cache coherent. Processor in socket zero can access the memory, access the memory physically on the processor in socket one and vice versa. Any process that's on socket one can talk to the PCI device that's, that's on the PCI bus of the, of the other socket. Right? Now, processes themselves, as they're running around, if you look at it from a systems level, they're simply scheduled by the operating system. You have, a, you have a thread that's supposed to be handling an interrupt from the interface, and that process gets scheduled, and it's put somewhere on a core on one of the sockets and does what it's, and does what it's supposed to do. So one of the tuning guide suggestions, which also turned out to be more or less a red herring, was that um, the interrupt handler, so when data comes in over the, data comes in over the network interface card, uh, something has to handle those packets that are coming in, and the, the first place they get handled are, is in an interrupt handling thread. And in the case of, in case of modern adapters, there are multiple threads that handle data coming from the, coming from the adapter. So the idea was, well, let's, mask the interrupt handlers so they only operate on the socket that is directly attached to the interface. So in the previous picture, on the left side, on the left side socket. Right? And so the idea there is that the interrupt handler is not going through the QPI bus. You sort of take the QPI bus that interconnects the two sockets, take them out of the, uh, take them out of the equation. The, the upshot of that is that it seemed to make a difference and like many of our other tests, they made a difference, but were only short-lived. They only happened for a short period of time. Uh, we still had, we still had wild fluctuation, even when we did, even when we started working around with paying attention to where memory was located, paying attention to where the NIC on the system was located, and trying to pin processes so that they, so that they, they weren't interacting over the QPI bus. So we ran, we ran tests and more tests, and more tests, and we banged our head against the wall for quite a period of, quite a period of time. There are, the, the, problem, the problem here is that there is a huge parameter search space. There are things that you change about, the things that you could change in the driver, so a number of parameters you could change in the driver. There are things that you could change in the TCP handling, how big buffers are, what are the default size of buffers, how many buffers you, you'll allow the kernel to allocate to, uh, to, kernel, to TCP kernel thread handling. There are, there are more options on your send and receive processes, which are user level processes, how big a chunk of data you're writing at a particular time, how long a test, how long a test lasts, and a variety of things. And we weren't converging. And over four to six months, we ran a large number of tests. This was not, we're running tests 24 by, 24 by 7 by six months. These were as needed, like, like everybody else. Um, you know, anybody who might be working on this would, had at least a, you know, three or four different jobs at the, 
at the same time. We were still seeing wild fluctuation, even sort of playing down inside the tuning guide, trying to do things that logically made sense about, about process play, uh, placement. And some of this is a, you know, to, to maybe gain some understanding, and I'm not claiming we have complete understanding, but we're getting closer, um, is that when you look at a packet coming in over the network, you have to understand what are the different pieces that have to process that, that have to process that incoming packet. So as the packet arrives, you know, sort of on the left side of the screen into the NIC, there is firmware that's running on the NIC that does some protocol processing for you. Some of it, you know, fully offloaded NICs can do almost all the TCP protocol processing in a separate processor that runs on the NIC. And hopefully that would be, uh, that would be an efficient thing. Then there's also the other side of the NIC driver that's actually running on the host, that's actually running on the host operating system. And so the NIC driver is really shared. The NIC driver sits, part of it sits in the, in the NIC itself, part of it sits in the kernel memory itself. Right, and those two have to cooperate. And that's, this is, uh, although the source is open, the firmware, the source of the firmware is closed, but the source, of the, the source of the driver on the operating system is open. You can inspect some of it. So the packet comes, packet is first processed by the, is first processed by the NIC driver, whether it's in the NIC itself or in the kernel memory. There may be additional TCP handling in the kernel itself. So there's another, there's another stage, this sort of blue kind of, this, this, this blue smiley arrow that's sitting here that says kernel TCP handling. Um, and then finally, the packet gets delivered to the user memory. So if things aren't efficient, or if cache lines aren't aligned, or a variety of other things that can conspire against you, your receiving performance can get to be very, uh, can get to be very bad. In, if you're trying to receive at 40 gigabits per second, you really need about 10 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. You have the memory band, you have the, you have packets that are flowing in from the NIC processed by the kernel and then packets that are being passed from the kernel into, into user memory, usually a, a memory copy. Technologies like Rachi and iWarp, which are, which are remote direct memory access, can eliminate one of those memory copies, but they're not universal. And those, those come with their own host of, their own host of problems. So finally, in September 2014, um, you know, we were beating our head against the wall against dual socket servers. We moved to a single socket server, and you know, a big thank you and 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 a nice kiss to uh, the folks up in Santa Clara at Intel. Haswell level servers or Haswell revision servers were available. Haswell were available in a desktop for a while. Now came in a server in a server variety. And we went and we built a new physical configuration. One, the memory bandwidth of, of Haswell is about 20% improved over, pre, over the previous generation, about 30% improved uh, over what we were testing on. Installed the, we went, we installed the latest drivers. We threw out all the tuning parameters because we were literally not making, we, we couldn't make sense out of what our changes were doing. There, our results were simply not uh, reproducible. Then we went through and we turned off anything that looked like power energy savings. Go into the BIOS and configure and say, this machine should never go to sleep. In the BIOS, it should never derate or declock the CPU. It should never do that. In, on the Linux side, we would do the same thing. Turn off any sort of CPU governance. So we took our, little, we took our single socket server and we plugged it into Mr. Fusion because we're burning up lots of power. And that's the way we're running, that's the way we're running these systems uh, today. You can build your own 40 gigabit Ethernet endpoint today for about 2K. Um, if, you, you know, if you want a parts list from me, contact me offline. I'll, I'll point you at this spreadsheet, which is sort of our current, uh, current working configuration. This is, a system that will, this is a system that will sustain 40 gigabits. So we have a couple of, these, so we have a couple of systems running, single socket, this is, uh, this is, this is long-term persona, about a month worth of traces between those two systems that are sitting right next to each other in our machine room to make sure that we were not ever seeing any significant variation in performance over long periods, 
over long periods of time. So this, these tests run uh, these tests run hourly between these two nodes, and we have this nice flat line of performance, sort of sending and sort of sending and receiving, that is sitting right up at 39 gigabits per second, which, for all intents and purposes, is full line rate. There is there is protocol overhead uh, within TCP, and so at that point, we say we're happy. We think we're done, and. Um, the good thing about the single socket server is that we now had an endpoint that we could count on being able to both send and receive at line rate, single stream, without any, without any issue. Much, much, much lower variation. In fact, we haven't detected any variation at all in performance other than a few percent, which you would attribute to just OS scheduling. Um, we use single port cards on this one. Uh, it turns out, you know, as we go forward, that single port cards, dual port cards, really makes no difference uh, in the in the sum total of things. And we said, okay, we're done, fixed it, happy, go on to the next, go on to the next problem. And the reality was that um, no, we were we were not done. So the nice thing is that we have this ni nice working single socket, 40 gigabit Ethernet endpoint, we can leave it alone. We finally, have a, we finally have a stable point inside of our network to do real testing against, right? And then what we did is we went back to our dual socket server and everything that we learned from the single socket server about adjusting TCP windows, about adjusting TCP buffers, about setting a, a transmit queue lengths in, in the driver, turning off, uh, turning off uh, CPU governing so that the CPU is always running at full rate, turning back on something called IRQ balancing, which is where interrupts are handled uh, for the NIC driver. This was actually counter to the tuning guide, but you know you had to go and dig into release notes of the latest driver to find out that that's actually the way you should be running. So uh, you had conflicting information, and then then we started looking at our dual socket receive performance. And we would see these sorts of, we'd see our received performance in sort of uh, four distinct bands. It was either running at 39 gigabits per second, it was running at 33 gigabits per second, it was running at 26 gigabits per second, or it was running at 9 gigabits per second. Remember, the other side of this is actually the single socket server that we know will deliver 40 gigabits all day long without, uh, you know, without, breaking, without breaking stride. The good thing is that the absolutely terrible kind of uh, variation we were getting where we would see you know, one megabit per second sort of times in our, in, in our transmission, those were all gone. We would stay stably, you know, our lower bound was now in the eight, eight and a half gigabit per second range. Still not good, right? We're still at less than 25% of what the, what the adapter will carry. But there were conditions about when we would actually see full rate on a dual socket on a dual socket server. So we started looking more deeply and to try to figure out, try to characterize what was, what was going on. And so we would do some things, and these are some this is sort of some instantaneous measurements that we would take at various times trying to figure out what was going on. So the first, the first line is this out of box performance, do nothing. Let the OS schedule everything for you, where interrupts are handled, where your user level receive process is located, and we typically see about 29 gigabits per second. So that was the band, that was the nominal performance. Every now and then when you did that, you got lucky. Every now and then when you did that, you got unlucky. Those were the bands of performance that we saw. So then we said, well, let's bind the, let's bind the receiving process to the socket where the adapter is located. Physic so what we were trying to do, where we were trying to mask interrupts before so that they only were handled on the socket where the adapter was physically located. Let's take the receive process and put it in, this, put it in the same place. Right? So this is the, the, you know, the, the command line for actually being able to do that. And then we started running at 37 and a half gigabits per second. Reliable, it was stable, there was very little variation. We said, okay, we're starting to gain a little bit more insight. We bind the receiving process to the other one, the opposite socket, the socket that does not have the physical adapter uh, directly on its uh, directly on its I/O bus, and we would see eight and a half gigabits per second, and that eight and a half to nine, and that was also a reliable number. Sort of no matter what we did, and we finally got to a point where 
we were, we were honing in on uh, a set of experiments that we could send to a vendor and say, we're not just getting bad performance sort of randomly. We can get you repeat poor performance on this system. And we have another system that we know is always giving us good performance. It's not, it's not the other end. It's, it's, something in, it's something in this endpoint. So uh, we discussed, at that point, it was CPU affinity of the receiving process that made uh, that, that was making a large difference in our performance. Uh, and so we talked to others who sort of work in this arena, trying to figure out how to use 40 gigabit Ethernet. And, and comments would come out like, well, you know, systems just have good cores and bad cores, not really trying to understand what was going on. And they say, yep, we see that performance variation too, but, too, but we're highly tuned. And they went off and they were concerned with other things in their life. Uh, I had people tell me my clock speed was too low which always perplexed me because at whatever clock speed I was using, there was a condition in which I could get uh, close, to, close to line rate. And then you have to bind interrupt handling, and I could tell them, um, no, that actually doesn't make a difference. In fact, it, it, uh, it objectively made performance, um, performance worse at that way. So then we went through and said, well, I, you know, is this a fundamental hardware issue that we're seeing, or is it a software, is it a software issue? So then we go and we change, the only, the only change between the sort of dense slide of numbers and the previous dense slide of numbers is we've exchanged the kernel. It is the same piece of hardware connected to the same network switch. All the other software is unchanged. The only thing that has been changed is the kernel and, and, the, and the NIC driver recompiled for that version of the kernel. So now when we did that, we got objectively different for object, objectively different performance. So not doing anything, we would routinely see about 35 gigabits per second. That actually made me pretty happy when I saw it. it wasn't sort of at full rate, but at least sort of not doing anything, letting the OS schedule things around, it was being a bit smarter. If we bound to the CPU that actually was closest to the network interface card, our performance went down, which was still, is still a head scratcher. But if we bound to the other, so-called what, what, what I would call the bad socket, performance was 24, 21 gigabits per second and change. And so we put those up on a table so they sort of summarize those two dense slides together. You can look at the top line being the 3.10 kernel, which is what's used in CentOS 7, and the 2.6 kernel, which is what's used in CentOS, uh, CentOS 6. And no binding. You know, they're, 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 they're kind of close performance, but the 3.10 kernel was better. The same socket, uh, we'd, actually see better, we'd actually see better performance uh, on, on the older, older generation of kernel. On the opposite socket, or, or the bad socket, was a marked sort of change in performance. And if we did things, you know, if we played lots of games, like we pinned memory and we pinned, and we pinned receiving processes so that we really were uh, not going over the QPI bus, we sort of took the other processor out of the equation, then we would see roughly full rate at three. Any, anything above 38 gigabits per second is really considered to be, uh, really considered to be full rate. One of the things though, down at the bottom of this slide is that, well, the sending performance on 3.10 was actually, that, that particular version was actually significantly worse. And you know, that, that, is, that has since been solved with an updated, updated version of the kernel. Uh, so finally, at this point, remember it's taken us nine months to get here. This is why this, is, this talk is titled In the Trenches, because this is, a trench, this is what trench warfare looks like when you're trying to do uh, high performance networking. Um, it took nine months for us to get here, calendar time. That wasn't nine months of 100% time working on it. That was just, you know, as we would do things, we would have an idea and try something else and, and then bang our head against the wall a little bit more. So then I went and talked to uh, various folks that I know in the community at, uh, at SC, people that I, you know, sort of highly respected. Uh, one observation was, well, maybe it's a cache line issue across the QPI, right? So that, you know, we were getting sort of bad performance because we were going across QPI and it was something that was just really bad and conspiring against us. Um, some cores are just bad. We got that comment again, not really trying to understand what was going on. You need a faster CPU again, so sort of same, 
same tome. And then one of our local engineer, network engineers here said to me, uh, well, have you ta traced the TCP conversation while things are going on the bad core? And I thought, I said, well, that's actually a good idea. I know it should impact performance, um, should negatively impact performance, but at least we would see what, what TCP was, was looking at underneath. And then we got sort of a, we got sort of a big surprise. So this was on running to, the, running to the core, or running to the socket where we were previously getting about nine gigabits per second. If we simply turned on a TCP dump process or, uh, or, um, uh, or T-Sharks, which is, so running a, running a, a PCAP, lib PCAP, um, all of a sudden our performance went from nine gigabits per second to almost 30 on the bad core. And we, we just kind of went, what? That, that, that I, I'm, you know, you look at things and you think you have understanding, and then you see something that looks like this, say, wait a minute, I'm dumping, I'm actually doing more work on each network packet that's coming in, and I'm getting better performance by doing more work. That, that, that doesn't make, that, it didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from a memory point of view. It makes sense from there's a bug in the driver, a bug in the driver point of view. So some other things that we tried because once we started, once we saw this sort of interaction, what were other parameters we could play with in the driver to see what we, what we did. So one of the things we did was to turn off TCP receive side checksumming in the NIC driver itself. Receive side checksumming is still going on, but instead of using the NIC driver implementation, it reverts back to the generic Linux kernel implementation that if the NIC driver doesn't do it, the, the, the kernel will do it. That was, in this configuration, that was the best thing that we could do to get performance to be pretty consistent between the sockets. So you can see here 26 and 29. Now, we gave away a bunch of performance, right? We, we're, we're no longer at close to 40, but at least, the, at least the performance is sort of irrelevant as to which core your process is actually scheduled on. We also tried some other things turning off another piece inside the driver called generic receive offload. That seemed to, that, you know, that did something, but it was actually worse. The best thing we could do was, was turn off receive side checksumming. So finally, we have, you know, we have a set of things that we can go to the driver manufacturer about, Mellanox in this case. Gave them a whole pile of data, told them exactly what we were doing, gave them all the sort of experimental parameters so that they could reproduce the problem in their lab should they choose. And crickets, nothing for six weeks. Sent them things and it went into a big black hole. Sort of not, I, you know, in some sense not unusual, but uh, not a promotional bell ringer for this particular vendor. Uh, there was no, in that six weeks, no real acknowledgement of the issue. They made no attempt to reproduce in their lab. And we were likely the first people that walked up to them and said, here's the problem, here's a problem or how we manifest a problem in your driver. It's sort of up to you to go inside your code, some of which we can see, some, a lot of which we can't see, um, and, and, go, and go figure it out. So you know, we, had, uh, we were able to sort of give them sort of this combination of whether we were doing process pinning, memory pinning, both or neither and get nicely reproducible results for them to go play with, but they, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything until we came at the, until we were coming to a decision point at SDSC about whether we were going to use them or a different vendor for uh, a large number of 40 gigabit ethernet adapters that they actually started paying attention to us. So while we were waiting, we went and we looked at a different vendor, a Chelsea OT5. We had looked at Chelsea before, but you know, in, in sort of the March timeframe of last year, um, they had locked optics, which was sort of a non-starter for us. We couldn't put our own we couldn't put our own cables in the NIC, which didn't which didn't make sense. They wouldn't support a particular brand of copper cables. Um, the other end of our switch wouldn't support sort of other brands of copper cables. We were just sort of stuck. We couldn't make we couldn't make good connections unless we were doing purely unless we were doing uh, purely optics. Uh, the performance, again, back then was pretty unstable, but I said, well, let's go and revisit this vendor. Now it's been nine months. They may have improved things. And they had. The locked optics problem was fixed. Uh, the single stream performance was 33 gigabits per second, sort of out of the box without having to think about it. It wasn't sensitive. We played around everything we did. We played around with CPU affinity, memory affinity, you know, binding, 
all the tricks that we were playing in the Mellanox world, and nothing seemed to happen. Basically, the network and the, the driver engineers were doing a lot better job of managing sort of the complex memory hierarchy inside of a dual socket system. Single, so single stream was 33 gigabits per second, not quite where we want it to be, but if we did dual two streams, it would deliver at 40, gigab 40 gigabits per second. So, you know, a, a, viable, hardware, uh, a viable hardware vendor uh, for, uh, for, for this kind of work. And then we did something, we said, well, we have these really fancy network interface cards. They actually have hardware offloading. Let's turn the hardware offloading and see what we get. And all of a sudden, our performance went from 33 gigabits per second to 3 gigabits per second. And no, that's not a typo. And I wanted to bang my head against the wall again, because I felt like I had come from full circle and had made no progress. Um, but we've, we've, we've made progress. So finally, uh, about six weeks after contacting Mellanox, uh, they, they finally came back and they said, oh, let's put a network engineer on your systems. And they sat on our systems for a day or day and a half. These are the guys, they know their software. And finally, they said, OK, we solved it. And they went away. And they weren't going to tell us what they did to solve it. And they did this interesting thing where their solution ended up with single stream performance down to 33 gigabits per second, looked just like the Chelsea numbers. And dual stream performance at 39 gigabits per second looks just like the Chelsea numbers. But the important thing that they had done was that performance was symmetric between the sockets. Whatever was going on, we finally got to, we finally got to symmetric performance. Single stream wasn't quite where we wanted to be. Still not the same as, still not the same performance as we get off of a single socket server, but uh, much, much, much better. And all variation sort of has, has gone away. And then for the record, you know, that particular device command was something that we gave to ETH tool that was, you just, you know, this is, this is like, you have to have the secret password, secret password and handshake, and then you can put in the, then you can put in the right parameter and you can get good, you can get good performance. So uh, Mellanox has recently updated their driver again, meaning at the first part of this month. Single, single socket performance is still rock solid, which is good. The jury is still out on dual socket performance. We're trying, you know, we have to we have to go rerun a battery of tests to see uh, see where they are. But the first sort of indications of this is that it looks like they made the hidden performance tunable as sort of the default setting inside of their driver. So at least out of the box performance is sort of is is what you would expect it to be. So uh, let me let me close here. I, you know, we sort of started with this sort of targeted commodity level network. Um, we knew, we had learned a long time ago that we actually had to pay attention to the construction of the network endpoints to see if we could actually drive the, if we could drive the network. And right now, there's still interesting issues that mean 40 gigabit ethernet in the commodity space is still far from routine, but achievable.